Hey everyone, I've got Ian Lowe here. He's been working in software development for over 20 years and he's got a lot of experience in development and management and he found me on Twitter recently and we talked a little bit offline. I think he's got some really cool stuff to challenge me with and that we can just kind of go back and forth with him. I'm sure this is going to be good for many of you out there, so go ahead, Ian. Uh, yeah, well, so like the original reason that I reached out to you is uh, I saw uh, somebody tweeted a clip of yours from one of your videos, your, your interview with Scott, and right. uh, specifically the quote that they um, tweeted out was, uh, estimates are worthless. And uh, my immediate reaction was, well, that's a bunch of bullshit, and I figured um, I, should, I should probably take a look at who you were and, and, and the rest of what you were saying before I jumped down your throat. Um, so I took a look at the rest of what you were saying and who you were and decided I should still probably jump down your throat. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I mean, I get that, um, you know, there's, there's obviously an urge to say that estimates are, are worthless and from a certain perspective, I, I understand, you know, saying, well, in terms of providing 100% certainty, and I know that like the engineer brain always sort of wants to be able to say, well, you know, we're 100% certain about something. But, um, you know, to me, it's all about providing a degree of certainty. And, you know, as I was thinking about it, I was sort of like, well, you know, the CFO certainly estimates that he'll be able to pay you a paycheck for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, and everybody's sort of making predictions. And, and those predictions right. have a certain level of, um, you know, being right or wrong. And, and it's interesting. Just today, I was thinking about that. And I was saying sort of on Twitter, saying to code newbies, you know, you really have to practice estimating. Oh, I've yeah. seen... You know, I, I've worked with people that you ask them, well, how long is that going to take them to say three days? So well, three days, like that, that doesn't seem like very long. And they're like, okay, three months. And you're like, well, wait a second. And from that perspective, you know, I, I fully agree with you. Estimates are worthless. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I think we have to be able to, you got to be able to ballpark something and to be able to say, what's well, going to cost this much? It's going to take about this long. Um, some people add in buffers. Some people right. don't. There's there's different philosophies on that, right? Um, but I, I and and I'll I'll sort of I'll, I'll see what you think about all that. But I, I wanted to address also your your follow up point, which was how we uh, how we deal with people who are wrong. Um, and I think that there's a, sort of a in the small answer and an in the large answer. And and in the small, I think it's super super critical um, on a team, especially on a team. Um, to provide a safe environment for experimentation. Um, yes, if you're absolutely. not allowed to be wrong, you can't experiment, you can't grow, you can't innovate. So that's super critical. But in the large, people who are wrong over and over, the answer is we don't work with them. Right. Um, and you need to be able to predict, and your predictions need to be right. Um, so that, that's my side of the coin. <laughs> No, that's awesome. Uh, I think that's a great way to get me to clarify a little bit of what I <laughs> what I threw out there. Yeah, so uh, kind of like we were talking about offline, you know, one of the things that's really tough is getting any attention out there on social media these days. It's There's so much noise. You kind of have sure. to, like, shock people or throw something out there that makes people, like, stop for a second. Like, what the hell did he say? You know, or people just, like, scroll right past you. They could care yeah. less. Oh, top 40 ways to be more agile. Yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, people, right, right. they've read this so many times. So the in interesting thing, and I'm not trying to get out of this because I, I think I still want to talk about this. But um, so I that kind of quote um, actually was part of just the description text for the video. I actually didn't say they're worthless in the video. And no. I actually don't believe all estimates are worthless but i do think i can talk a little bit about what caused me to put that in the text because i wouldn't put something in the description text that i just like totally don't agree with i just put it in there in a very uh kind of poke the bear you know sort of way so a uh, couple things one is you know i was really blown away by the response on reddit i you know i took that little two minute clip where uh, scott and i were kind of going back and forth just talking about the process of estimating and threw it up on reddit and it got like 1.2 uh, k up up votes and and that was the most popular thing i've ever posted on reddit and the really cool thing about it was it had like f over 500 comments and i i personally 
you know, and I was talking to Scott about this too. I'm not an academic, so I'm not like Gartner out there surveying companies, but right. you know, just like you, I've been doing this for over 20 years as a consultant. And even before that, I mean, overall I've worked with like over 30 companies and it's like, when you work with company after company after company after company and you see over and over and over again the same things, yeah, I can't say with 100% certainty that this is a pattern that I can guarantee is true, but at least my experience has been the, the reliability of estimates on valuable work that's hard to predict right. is really low. And that's why, you know, and that's what you were talking about, uh, the point that I, the follow up point I made in that in that video, I think the bigger problem is that there's kind of this perception that similar to when you go in and you get your car fixed, you know, um, I, I, I always used to tell my wife, I can either be good with computers or cars, but not both like, because it's just my mind couldn't handle it all. Uh, right. but you know, I've met guys since then uh, that do somehow know both and it blows my mind but you know you take your car in to get fixed and they usually tell you ahead of time hey you know we're going to give you an estimate and and sometimes they'll come back to you and they'll go you know sorry we thought it was going to be two hundred dollars we got in there it's actually going to be two thousand right. dollars and then you have to decide as a you know customer do i want to move forward with that and you might ask some follow-up questions but i kind of look at it like the way a lot of managers and leaders treat him, uh, treat software developers who come back with that information is kind of like well you don't know what the hell you're doing why didn't you tell me ahead of time that it wasn't that it was two thousand dollars and then they actually yeah. get angry and threatening and it's like well i'm sorry that's what you estimated we have to cram this in so you know it should really be three hundred dollars you know i'll pay a little bit more but i'm not going to pay two thousand dollars there's just this like attitude of like because I'm a CEO or I'm a director or I'm the product owner, I can force my will on a group of people that are already doing really hard work and mm -hmm. have them burn themselves out basically to keep their job. And uh, first thing I want to say is I'm not saying that's all companies. It has not been all companies in my experience, but I, I think it's enough companies that just even looking on Reddit, those 500 comments, I mean, the comments were honestly the more validating thing to me than just that it got upvoted so much because right. I saw like comment after comment after comment of people arguing about, do I buffer three times? Do I buffer six times the estimate, you know, and all this stuff. And, well, and no, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think, and, and that's a really interesting point. And, and I think that the, the, one of the really big difficulties is where the pressure is coming from. And I think the big distinction with going to the, to the, the mechanic at the, you know, with the car is that, um, the, the, he's going to put the same pressure on his mechanic working in the shop that your, you know, product manager or your sales person or whatever it is, 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 is putting on you. Um, I went through a really interesting exercise super recently, last week actually with a client, where I said, well, you know, the work that you're looking at doing, um, you know, it, it's, it, it has a variable cost. Sure. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, well, don't give me any of that bullshit. I don't want this, you know, how long is the rope type pricing? Right. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, so I'll give you a price, you know, that you can, you know, put a, put a, a pin in. Sure. And so I came back to him and I gave him two different prices. And he said, well, he said, what are these two prices? I said, well, this one here, we'll call it X. X is the probable price. And this other price, we'll call it X2, is the worst case scenario price. Sure. And he's, he's like, okay, help me to understand those a bit. I'm like, fine. X2, if it costs more than X2, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. Right. If it and costs X, more, you're saying if it costs more than X2. That's right. Yeah. Gotcha. If it costs gotcha. more than X too, if it costs X, if it costs a bit more than X, like X is based on 20 years of experience. Right. Because again, it's that engineering brain that it's like, you know what? I can't tell you hundred percent, but right. based on 20 years experience, it will cost this plus or minus something, sure. something reasonable. Sure. Now, uh, we often get into the discussion of like, should I buffer 30% 
what's the standard amount to buffer? Right. There are some people that'll say multiply it by three. Uh, some people, uh, I, I've been in places where you take the estimate from the slowest, like like everybody estimates the task, and then you take the the worst estimate. So whatever it is that takes the longest. Sure. Um, and I think that in all of this, the biggest problem is a really, really bad communication breakdown between the development team and the other pieces and parts of the company. Definitely. So the question is, why do we need an accurate estimate? Why is that important? And if the only reason is so that we don't get yelled at, like we're doing something wrong and the company is doing something wrong. Um, when I'm a salesperson, the reason I want my estimate to be really accurate is because if I say it's 50 bucks and it turns out to be 50 bucks and I can sell another thing, I can create loyalty with my customer and I can get them coming back. And that's worth far more than anything else. Absolutely. Um, and I've had developers say to me, well, you know, we had a bug, but it went away. And they sort of go, yay. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, not yay. Like, this is a horrible situation. Like, why would we not know that? And in a similar way, I've had developers come to me and say, well, I think it'll take a week, but my estimate to you is three weeks. And I say, why? And they're like, oh, because it's buffered and all this kind of stuff. But I say, no, you have to be as accurate as possible. Um, and then it's the job of the salesperson or whoever is communicating with the client or the other departments, et cetera, to add the buffers as necessary for what those departments are going to do and the types of monkey wrenches those people are going to throw in. Because otherwise the thing gets buffered 18 times and the client very reasonably is looking at four changes to a static website and it's going to cost $23,000. And they're like, right. Right. what just happened? Yeah, well, that that's really cool. So um, you might have seen in some of my other videos, the first half of my career, I worked at a product company and I was an employee. And then the second half, I was in consulting. So I kind of have been through both sides of that dynamic of whether you're, you're building a product internally in a company to generate revenue or it's an internal product versus you're selling development services, which is kind of the description that you gave. Um, and man, in the, in the decade I was doing consulting, I had a lot of really interesting experiences around estimating um, that you made me think of there. So one thing that I just wanted to throw out there, I think maybe this will help the audience, is it seems like there's a couple things that, that we don't always uh, quantify when we make an estimate or we decide how we're going to estimate that, like, if you go up on Reddit, some people did touch on this a little, but there was a lot of anger, like, people, how could you possibly do it this way and how could you possibly do it that way? And, you know... That's cool. If anything, it got people talking, which is great, right. you know. Um, but like, so what's it, what's your number one thing that people forget to estimate? Well, probably it's not really that people forget to estimate something. It's more that the expectation between whoever's receiving that estimate and the estimator either isn't mm -hmm. communicated effectively or yeah. the way that the person's doing the estimation, they're not mature enough in their career yet to think through validating right. that what they've even been given to estimate includes everything that all, you know, all the work. Um, and what I mean by that just sort of is like a, a right. good example. I had a client, uh, the year before last, I went in there to, I was talking about my other interview, how I was kind of a firefighter for a while, it drove me nuts. You know, my agency had sold them this project. Uh, it was supposed to be a responsive redesign of a web application they had at that time. Apparently the, the developer or the consultant from our agency that went in there and he was let go, unfortunately, but, um, you know, he the client noticed like two thirds of the way into the project, they decided, oh, let me see how this looks on my phone. And it was like, it looked awful. And it was like, yeah. you know, you could blame the client and go, well, come on, man, you should check up on it earlier. Either way, right. you know, we needed to take responsibility for it as a consultancy, you know. So they sent me out there and it would have been nice if the only problem was that I just needed to, to 
you know, make it responsive. Uh, and and right. this is just the same thing that always happens to me when I end up on these, these troubled projects. So I go out there. There's a couple things I noticed that were big problems. One was our agency had done a design for them. We had some UX people that came in and worked with their business and, and designed their new website experience for them. But we only gave them comps for the desktop version. So it was like, right. you know, we were using Bootstrap, which is just, you know, one of the many frameworks out there to do responsive, yep. right? But there was sort of this assumption, oh, well, we're using Bootstrap, so it'll just Could work. And it's kind of like, dude, there's so <laughs> many little details, even if you're, I, I think Bootstrap's a great framework. I use it on tons of sites. I actually love it. Sure. It saves a ton of time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're offering professional services to a company and part of your deliverable is it's going to be responsive, I'm of the opinion personally that you need to kind of, and it wasn't that complicated of an application, but there were some, you know, navigation decisions that needed to be made. And there were certain panels that, you know, if they were on the PC, but, n you know, not on mobile. Yeah, I don't want to get into too much detail, but you see where this is going. It was basically sure, sure. like there was a huge hole in just the the design process where the what the client wanted they didn't even really know what they were getting and they didn't even know they didn't know what right. they were getting right right well um, so and and yeah. what i was going to say is my my number one thing that always gets forgotten is um and, and it's sort of it's going to bring me back to i to i think looping us back into the whole conversation okay. with regards to like how the development team experiences this sure um whether they're contractual or not is uh admin interfaces okay so like the client will say well i would like to have um you know I, i'd like to be able to have like products in my on my website okay like you want products on your website no problem and then they say um you know and there's these 12 products and it's sort of exactly what you're saying now they may not even realize that they need an admin interface Right. So now one of two things can happen. Either A, you can go away and build the thing with 12 products hard-coded and that creates all of the problems that it creates. Or B, you come back to them and you say, well, that's going to cost you X. Where X right. is basically triple what they were thinking. Right. And they're like, well, wait a minute. What kind of shit are you peddling? And you're like, well, did you think about how you're going to edit this thing? And they're like, oh, oh, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Oh, well, could we just do a thing where I upload a spreadsheet? And right. you're going, yeah, but then what happens halfway through the spreadsheet when there's an error? Do you want to roll everything back? Do you want right. to take just the ones that are good? Do you want to, you know, there's so many different aspects right. to an administrative, an, an admin interface that are often hidden. And what I was going to say before is that whether you are, I, I think your point about uh, you need to, to have the experience required to say, look, you don't know you need this. But have you considered it is a really huge one. Um, I also think that you need to be selling all the time. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, even if you were, and, and this is, you know, directly speaking, you know, hopefully to your audience is when you go to your senior developer, you're selling an idea. Here's my, you know, you know, lead developer person, like, here's my idea for the solution. I considered these three things. I rejected these two. Here's why I think we should go with this. It's going to be faster. It's going to be this, that, the other thing. And I've taken the time to justify my decision. Um, when you're the lead developer going to the product manager or the project manager or whatever that, here's what my team thinks. Here's why, etc. When you get into that mindset, you're justifying everything. Right. Earlier today on Twitter, I was saying, when you refactor, like you've got to be going somewhere. Right. You don't refactor just to move code around for fun. Right. And I think what really set me off about the video segments um, that, 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 you know... Right, that, that, that I posted, well, yeah. Right? But what really set me off was this idea that, like, this... And, and, and I get that this is not where you were going. Yeah. But I've seen the attitude before in some developers. There's a laziness. There's a fuck-it-all kind of ask, right. uh, uh, approach where they're like, yep. well... Nobody could, could could possibly estimate this accurately anyway. So fuck it. It's three weeks. And, uh, well, <laughs> we all know that's going to change. And it's right. like, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But as you get better, like, you'd be shocked how accurate my estimates are after 20 years of being sure. wrong. <laughs> no, no. And, and, I mean, 
I think there's so a couple things to unpack in there that I wanted to just be, touch on real quick if I could. Um, yeah. One is, you know, I did make that statement, and, or I tried to in that video, and I and I think some people picked up on it in the Reddit comments, which was really cool. Which is, I was I was making an example of first of all a custom solution that you're estimating, right. and second of all that they wanted an estimate for the entirety of it. And right. and one thing I think earlier in my career, I didn't do very well. And it's not something that I think the industry is helping developers with enough is breaking down designs into smaller Huge. things to estimate. Huge. So um, critical. And, and this is one of those things where <clears throat> the, the, the risk is, and this especially happened at the agency, the consulting agency I worked at, you know, the, the, and, the, and this could be the same just for my audience out there. If you're just a developer on a dev team, this happens there too, you know, if you're an employee. Yeah. Where if you've got a whole bunch of junior developers and they maybe don't know how to do that, the risk then is that management asks like a senior engineer or architect to estimate everything and then kind of like, well, hey, uh, why don't you just, you know, put in a, a, a multiplier for how much longer it's going to take the junior developers. And right. in my experience, I can only share my experience, that never works because what ends up happening is the the divide between that more senior person and the junior person first of all is a lot bigger than they think and i'm speaking from my own experience if i've ever tried to estimate from for someone else i always blow it the other thing is uh what i've seen happen is the junior developer will then go to start implementing it and they'll realize there's holes in the requirements or there's things that the person who originally estimated didn't think of and and this happens all the time right yeah. and now they go in there and they sort of realize ooh i need to get the business or my client you know to clarify this part of the code or this part of the design and yeah. now what happens is if that original estimate was given by someone else there's all of a sudden this well, the the senior guy who who's been doing this for twenty years, he estimated it, and he yeah. didn't ask me that question. Yeah. Are you sure you're not asking me this question because you're a junior dev? Because you know yeah. I I didn't think this was that complicated. Exactly, and yeah. and so I mean I I really think a, a lot of these issues, and you nailed it right at the beginning when you said communication breakdown. I think a lot of these issues is. And I'm just as much to blame for this, especially earlier in my career. We as developers don't take enough responsibility, I think, in educating the business on yeah. the details of software development. Right. We and, yeah. and Scott talked about this in his own way too, and I thought it was great. You know, we look at it like, hey, you hired me. I'm just and I you know, my boss years ago used to call people like this code monkeys. It's like literally yes. you insert spec. I write code and it's like other yeah. than that my brain does nothing and it's like right. who needs anybody like that you know right. even even for the simplest web application I think the thing that developers could be served well by at least it's helped me is if you take the responsibility that like look whenever I get a requirement this is a chance for me to look at it really critically and think about all the things that I know that the business may not have thought of and not just yeah. jump into coding because I'll tell you, you know, it's just like the old, you know, Godfather movies. It's like if you just get started on something and you make it 80% through and then you realize you could have clarified something, you look like an ass to the business, right? right. It's kind of well, like and, and they don't want to do the due diligence to really like, well, you know, I, I know you want me to get started coding, but I need right. some time to review this because I don't want to piss you off in two weeks when I tell you, Oh, uh, well, now that I'm 90% there, I have to rewrite and refactor everything, right? That's and right. some of that's and hard to give that level of uh, an expectation to a junior developer. Go, go ahead. Well, I, I, no, I mean, I, I, I violently agree with, with what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. Um, and it's why I got into building software in the first place, is I was like, wait, so I get to go and learn about all of these different companies right. and learn it's cool. about their business model and, and their totally. customers and how they do, you know, that's awesome. Yes. I think one of the things that's really shifted in our industry over the last, you know, 35 years, um, and that means, you know, before our time even, this shift right. started, um, 
and and it's shifted in the industry, but the perception outside the industry hasn't shifted. Okay. It's sad, um, but it's that uh, th this this the code monkey image I think comes from the this idea of developers doing the thing that only developers can do, which is writing code. And the reality is that there's been a commoditization of a certain level of coding. And what's happened, I, to our credit, in our industry, and I, I suspect that your audience is much better at this than people were when you and I started in the game, um, is having this overall vision of, of what's going on and having a, a, an understanding that goes beyond that. I think you're absolutely right when it comes to estimating. Like, there have been times... I remember, so I worked for a couple of years at um, Gameloft, which is a large mobile gaming company. Nice. Um, and I ran uh, the teams that built all of the back-end logic for all of the games. Cool. Um, so it was pretty intense. All that. And um, <laughs> all that, yeah. one of the issues that we had at one point was there was a problem with socket handling code where... Um, there, there was just too much going on with sockets and uh, handing off control, and we were using threading. Um, there's an ongoing debate of like threading versus forking and stuff like this, but anyway, it was a complicated problem. Oh yeah, and it had to do with like scheduling at the OS level of how things were being scheduled and locked down to OS threads and stuff, and. Um, and, and HQ called me up and said, well, you know, can you, can you work faster and can you get this done faster? And I said, no. And they said, well, how long is it going to take? And I said, I, I don't know. I said, I can give you a ballpark. It's going to take less than three weeks. But, but I really legitimately don't know. We might figure it out in the next two hours, but it might take us three days. Um, and I, there are engineering problems yeah, that are like, that are deep problems having Absolutely. to do usually with the edges of what we do. Um, so if you're working in JavaScript, for example, they have to do with um, promises and futures um, yep. unwinding. And, Absolutely. Uh, Everybody you know, hates stats. that. Yep. Right? Yep. So those are deep problems, and estimating those is very, very difficult. You but can't, you 90 can. percent of our work yeah. is not that. Right. You know? Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I was on a project uh, last year where, you know, I went in there. It was an iPad application. I was the only developer on it. And then I had a developer from the client who was building the REST API. It was actually a really cool project. It was supposed to be really short. And the whole app got built, like, for two-thirds of the original schedule. We were pretty much ready to go. And then when we were – we were already doing beta testing on a whole bunch of their – uh, iPads and devices, but yep. people started noticing if they left the let the app run for like 18 hours, it would bomb. Right? Yep. It was classic memory leak, and we were using a framework that wasn't like you know I've done mobile apps in Swift before, you know, on iOS, mm -hmm. which is like pretty much right on top of Objective C. Oh wow, I'm right. getting way too geeky for my audience here. So the point was, <laughs> there was a memory leak, and I mean this took calling Microsoft and this third-party vendor and all these different people and going through support. And it's like at that point, the good news was the consulting agency I worked for, they'd encountered situations like this enough times and they had enough goodwill built up with that client and they were really happy with the work I was doing that we kind of like, I think we either split the cost or, or somehow they agreed to buy us. Sure. Or, or, oh, I remember what it was. They had a maintenance contract from another mm -hmm. product we had built for them for like a certain number of hours of maintenance. And they just used right. that kind of to cover it. So, uh, you know, when those things happen, I think if the relationship between people is good and that people trust each other, that they know what they're doing, you can you can work through a complicated like roadblock like that. It's when I think yeah. there's doubts where, you know, either the, the receiver of the work is already like disillusioned with the team or they don't understand enough about the uncertainty of software development. Right. This is like the whole theme that I'm talking about in all my videos is just like that and this is why I'm huge on lean software development. Uh, that same, that same. I'll just throw in this last thing and then switch it over to you. But that, yeah. you're just making me think of a lot of really cool stuff. Um, that same client, there was a director there, 
And he mm -hmm. was kind of watching some of my videos when I was first starting out. And we were having a lot of really cool conversations. And he was kind of like, Jamie, well, I worked at this one company where we had to build an integrator for, uh, what was it? It was either SAP or, or something like that for this other mm -hmm. product. And he's like, you know, we couldn't do that lean because, you know, it was this huge connector to this API with like 40 API calls. We needed to know exactly how much it was going to cost. And I was like, well, is that really true? Because what happened with that project? Did you guys get started on it and find anything that you found out that you didn't know? Oh, yeah, right, right away. You know, we got started on it. And even the first API call, we were like, oh, there's this whole token handling thing we never thought of. So, like, I'm really big on lean um, because I think even doing this 20 years, uh, I just continually find new and frustrating ways that I think I've scoped things right. And I get in there and there is some challenge that either I didn't realize, not because I'm an unexperienced developer, but because there's right. basically infinite complexity to these technologies, especially when you combine two together. And that's the thing I think people don't realize yeah. is like you take one technology that has like 50,000 API calls, you plug it into another, do the math on the probability of how things can go wrong there. It's pretty right. obvious. So I'm just really big on, you know, in like the Toyota production system, you know, which is what the whole lean stuff came from. When there's a car manufacturer and they're going to use a supplier, let's say they're going to pick one supplier and they're going to be their supplier of some certain type of bolts. Instead of them going, hey, how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of bolts can you produce to have them sitting here in our warehouse, you know, in a couple months from now, they just go, We'd like you to produce, we're going to budget to purchase, you know, let's say a thousand bolts per month. And we're going to have a relationship the way our contract's set up so that if we get increased needs in production, like we, we all of a sudden need to produce more cars or there's defects, we want you to agree that you're able to turn around with an increased capacity of some certain percentage within a certain time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think... This is what, you know, if you look at like Yahoo and Etsy and some of these companies that have really nailed continuous delivery, they have a whole bunch of tools that they've built internally uh, that they use so they can do these experiments, right? So they can basically, right. instead of just trying to bite off this huge product, uh, they just do a little bit. And the, the best part about that, I think, is it surfaces the, the unknowns earlier, you know? Right. Uh, there was this, I read somewhere in one of the books I've read about lean, like how if somebody were to give you a, a list of cards with the alphabet, you know, A to Z, and each card has A through Z, and you just had to sit there and time yourself reading one at a time, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then somebody gave you a set of cards below it that had the number, so A, 1, B, 2, and you time yourself it's like 20 to 30% longer than just were you to add the two up independently just because of right. the task switching, right? And yeah. the point the author was trying to make is, especially when there's a new team, when we get started on a software project, there's usually things about the software that the product manager, for example, doesn't know are things he needs to think about or make decisions on mm -hmm. because it's a new product. There's things the yeah. developers don't know that they are going to have to handle on that project that's never been in a project they've built before. And it's like what ends up happening, I think, is whenever we scope and estimate, even if we call it a rough estimate, it's like you give that rough estimate to a VP and they don't really understand the risks of software development. It's kind of like yeah. just you're giving them a dagger to start stabbing people, right? Well, so, and, and I think uh, my... So, so where I got involved with agile development in general um, is, you know, almost 20 years ago now. We had a project that was in trouble. And I went back to the client and I said, look, we're going to deliver, you know, uh, weekly and you'll pick the next features. Um, and that worked really well. But um, I do think that there's... Um, ah, it's my turn to say something controversial. Um, I do think there's something inefficient about Agile. And 
can you quantify it? Do you I, mean Scrum specifically or, or like what um, part of Agile, I guess? Not, not specifically. What I mean is that okay. um, methodologies that include high amount... Okay, let me put it this way. Imagine an insane world where, for some odd reason, um, development never needs to talk to sales because they know exactly what sales is selling. Sales never needs to talk to development because they understand exactly what sale development is building. Um, the finance never has to talk to anybody else because they know exactly how to predict exactly how much money. In that world, you're super, super efficient because right. you never waste any overhead communicating. Right. So I think we do have to come to terms with the reality that communication is overhead. It's not development. It's not moving our system forward. Um, we're not producing sellable features. Um, when we communicate, we reduce the amount of fuck-ups, but we don't right. actually increase anything. Right. So, um, Well, we increase alignment, right? That's really yes. what we do by communicating, is we increase alignment. Because, I mean, one of the things that... I'll just throw this in here real quick and let you keep going. Sure, yeah. One of the things, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, probably you are, with John Cutler. Um, yep. He's like a product manager, really popular articles yep. on Medium. Um, he did this one little video, I think it was a couple, maybe it might even been a couple years ago now, <clears throat> where he was talking about as a product manager, trying to cultivate, I think he used the term, a shared understanding across a company and how hard that right. is. Yes, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about, right? A little well, bit. Well, it, it is. And, you know, one of the huge challenges that I've had is convincing people to use the right words to refer to things. And they'll say, oh, you know, uh, we call that the, um, the something something. And I'll say, well, don't call it that um, because that actually means something and it means this other thing. Right. Um, so, you know, you're going to confuse things. Right. Um, listen, shared understanding is great. And I think as a goal, it's critical. But the question is, how do we get there? And how much energy do we spend producing that shared understanding? Right. Um, I've, had, um, I've, I've had superiors in the past who have sought to understand every detail of what we're doing under the banner of shared understanding. Yeah. And I'm like... I don't think that's what I'm John like, was talking about. Yeah. No, I get it. It's just... It, it's a it's a very difficult thing to judge how much understanding is a reasonable amount. Absolutely. So what I'm what no, I'm getting at is that like, um, and I was thinking about this when you were talking about the fact that you had a good relationship with this company, so you were able to go and you know take hours from an agreement and stuff. And I thought to myself, wow, like this is totally something I talk about all the time um, with my teams, and I and I tell people without giving you a formula for how to buffer. The thing is that every hour that you don't spend on something that you thought you were going to spend on goes into a bank. Um, and at some point, you give it back Right. if there's, if there's something left. But right. in other cases, you take from that bank and you're like, well, overall, we hit the target anyway. Because right. your marketing department, for example, um, doesn't care week by week unless they're super agile and super, you know, they're running, let's say, quarterly promotions and, and things like this. So they're trying to hit different deadlines. I've worked in companies that go to trade shows. So everything, you know, revolves around the trade show. Um, right. at, at, uh, at a gaming company, like Christmas time, forget it. Like Christmas time is, Nuts. you know, like you have no life leading up to Christmas because yeah. literally there's a drop dead date. Um, and by the way, on the server side, if on the 25th of December, when all of those kids open their brand new, you know, iPhone and start playing that game, the server goes down, like you are losing hundreds of thousands of euros, like oh, yeah. possibly like per hour, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and you might make, I don't know, 60% of your revenue in five or six days after Christmas. Which so, gives me, which I got to ask the question, what kind of business would introduce substantial change to a product with that level of risk that close to a deadline? It's the payoff. It's always risk reward ratio. And and this is the thing though that I, I don't want to rant too much, but really frustrates no, me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing that really frustrates me is I think a couple things. One is uh what you were talking about with Agile, you know, I think one of the things that's really driven me nuts about it and, and most people that, that like you learned about this decades ago 
and are just sure. seeing it unravel and get abused by consultants and by you know management to be whatever the hell they want. Yeah. Nowhere in Agile did it say, we will create fixed deadlines and pressure teams to get as much done possible within that as, as they can. All it said no, is, but, we're going to try to do smaller chunks of work at a time. What happens but, but, when we don't hit that chunk? That's where the agility comes in, in my opinion, which yeah, is like you, you got to you have to look at the difference between, you know, when you go down to Ikea and you buy a piece of art to put on your office wall, yeah. like that was created in drastically different circumstances from a studio where the artists hang out smoking pot and like, you know, doing paintings. All right. Day. And you have to realize and, and this is it is a hard here's a hard pill to swallow developers. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. The vast majority of us do not get to work in a hippy dippy studio where it doesn't really matter if we hit our targets. And this is one of the things that I've seen anyway in the startup scene. Um, you know, uh, in the last let's say 10, 15 years, it's gotten better, frankly, in the last five years. But there was a period of time where startups were just like. Hey, it's super cool, and we get free lunch, and there's you know segways to ride around the halls, and I'm going like, uh, you know, I, I walked into one company where they they in fact I was hired specifically because they were having trouble with this. Yeah. So early in their life, they had bought a ping pong table because they loved ping pong. So the result was they had developers playing ping pong all day. So when you have people going tack 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 all day long, what does everybody else do? They put their headphones on. Right. As soon as they put their headphones on, what do they stop doing? Talking to each other. Oh, you're 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 lagging so for a second. You had a company you're, where you're everybody was sitting less than five feet from each other, emailing each other. Oh dear. You're back. <laughs> there was just a, there was yeah, you're caught okay. up. So you were you left off where you're talking about everybody puts the headphones on. What does that do? I thought that was a really important point if you want to go from there. So yeah, as yeah. soon as they put the headphones on and, and there's a guy who uh uh, writes about methodologies. His name is Alistair Coburn. Oh, yeah, um, I'm familiar with him. He has uh, an absolutely brilliant concept, which is, oh, I'm going to fuck it up. Uh, this was my moment. The the erg cost of transmission of information. Okay? So it's how much does it cost to move information from one person to another? And he talks about how when you structure your workspace to put people close to each other, right? So what's the, the ultimate of that is pair programming, for example. Right. Um, but if you put up dividers, if you put people in different rooms, all of this increases the cost of communicating. So as soon as you put those headphones on, what do you not hear anymore? You don't hear the person next to you cursing because their compile isn't working and hasn't been working for 15 minutes, but they're too proud to say anything about it. Right. Um, you don't hear the salesperson um, on a conversation with the client say, well, I know we promised you that, but we weren't able to build it. You know, th you lose so much. Can, can you, honestly though, so that particular point, and, yeah. and, and this is, I was kind of trying to do the same thing with the Agile point, I just didn't get there. There's a huge debate in the industry to this day. I mean, there's probably 50% of articles on one side of the argument and 50% on the other of remote versus local or open office yeah. spaces versus cubes. And sure. I guess the, 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 the point I'm trying to make with this channel, and I think you're in agreement with me, really, when we talk about this, I'm just kind of yeah. clarifying. And, and I love these interviews because they get me to think, what the hell am I really trying to say? Uh, you know, I, I'm still <laughs> yeah. trying to figure some of this out after 20 years. When I talk about how uncertain things are, and I talk about, you know, being lean, and I talk about trying to hit a deadline and how bad estimates suck, I want to be clear here, and I probably should have at the beginning of this, but uh, I want to be clear here that what I'm trying to say is not, and this is what I think is so hard for developers to swallow, and which is why I don't go speak at conferences because I, I, I can't stand when people get up on stage and go, this is the practice you should follow. It's 100%. BS because yeah. I think it's so contextual. 
You know, yeah. well, it depends on let, the let company me. you're at, the culture you're in. It depends on the sales process. It depends on, you know, like when you even talked about communication, if you've got a developer where, and I've talked about this in some other videos, his preferred method of communication, meaning he's really responsive over Slack. Like you can ask yep. him a question and get a, a, a you know millisecond response, and he's really verbose and can go into a lot of detail. Well, do you want to force him to sit next to the salesperson no. all day? No. No. So again, the I, I think what's so hard and what drives me friggin' nuts in this industry is that you know, like I can sit here with you and you've got some different viewpoints than me, but like clearly because you've been doing this for so long, you can go into detail about why you come to the conclusions you do and why they're applicable. There's this whole ton of money that's made and, and, and a whole attitude that's being pushed through, you know, whether it's medium or, or Twitter or whatever, yeah. where, you know, people write these articles and they're like, here's the thing that you're missing, man. So, and it's like, yeah, so, well, they're, they're not telling you everything about why that works for them. Anyway, right. go, so, go ahead. So let me get, yeah. well, no, it, it, it's awesome. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm getting excited because I, I love this path. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you three things. And okay. two of them are about famous people that we know. Um, the first one is about Uncle Bob Martin, um, oh, yeah. and uh, somebody contacted me the other day and said, um, I've been trying to apply Uncle Bob's something-something methodology when I de designed my systems, but I've been struggling with this, that, and the other thing. And I wrote back, and it was Twitter, in fairness to Uncle Bob, so I didn't have a lot of space to make my, my answer pleasant. Um, but I wrote back, and I said, look, I said, Uncle Bob's trying to sell books. I said, there's no such thing as a correct system. It's a, it's a ludicrous concept. It's speaking exactly to what you're saying. Yeah. Um, everything is contextual. Um, there's, there is an industry, you're absolutely right, of books and speakers and so on saying, this is the one true way of doing things. And by the way, um, anybody who's watching, go back 20 years, look at the books then, um, about the only guy who actually captured the one true way of doing things was Don Knuth. Um, and if you can make it through his books, uh, Bill Gates <laughs> has a job for you. Um, but uh, I want to tell you a story, second of all, about another person that we probably know who is Kent Beck. Okay, um, yes. And uh, many, many years ago, I was uh, running a, an extreme programmers uh, group in Montreal, um, which is where I'm from. And um, we absolutely amazingly got Kent Beck to come and speak at our at our meeting. And awesome. I mean, speak is a big word. Like, he came to join us at the coffee shop and shoot the shit. That's awesome. And I was like, I was like, this is going to be great. It's, it's you know, Kent the Beck. Yes. And it's going to be, it's going to be phenomenal. And I'm going to leave this, this evening transformed and infused with the holy grail of methodology, you know, godfather <laughs> infusion. That's awesome. You were and hyped. We there, you were really I, hyped. Dude, oh yeah. I was I was yeah. pumped as shit. I was like nice. and, and I'm going to be able to touch this guy, you know? He won't be on stage. <laughs> and so we go there and we're asking him, "Okay, so so how do we do like this and this?" And he's like, "Well, he's like, really, it's all about sort of an iterative refinement. So no company is ever going to be perfect. You always just sort of improve things one step at a time and i'm like yeah but like but like what's the thing that you do to like get the company to be like agile right and he's like well no like you sort of pick a practice that isn't agile and you make it a little more agile i'm like no no but like what's the formula for fuck's sake and he's like there's no formula dude he was speaking um, truth to you man he, he was, and which brings me to my third That's amazing. Point, and, that and is then so I'll cool. And it back to you. Yeah. Um, because Kent Beck blew my mind, and here I am. It's got to be 15, 17 years ago or something. Um, and 17 years later, um, somebody asked me, what is your number one book for software developers? And I said, oh, that's easy. It's A Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. I have not read that. You I'll must need read to. It. Um, I will. It is. Yes. Sounds um, cool. So I love the title. Now, the interesting thing is you're going to read it. You're going to be like, oh, what the fuck? Like, it's, it's basically like reading the Tao Te Ching because, or the Bhagavad Gita. Like, it's a philosophy book. Awesome. 
And I was talking to these guys about it. We were going back and forth. And um, they said, um, what, you know, like, why is, why is it this book? And I said, because every truth that you need to know is in this book if you unpack it. And speaking exactly to what you were saying, you're absolutely right. Context is everything. You have to hold on to values. And you have to drive aggressively towards values. Yep. The way that those values are expressed in a given context, it might be Slack, it might be an open, con uh, an open concept, it might be quarterly meetings, weekly yep. meetings, daily meetings. I don't know any more than Kent Beck does. Right. Well, <clears throat> uh, so I had done this video that, that you're, you're really making me think of because I think it underscores this point that... Um, wait, something no, horrible go, go has ahead. happened that you're going to have to cut out. I need to go and get my power cord. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I'll cut it out. Second. I'll cut it out. No Give worries. <laughs> yeah, so... <sighs> wow, that's a lot to unpack just right there. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, I'm going to have to do this again with you. This was great. Uh, I'd love to. I think the hard part and why I'm so adamant about this whole people being familiar with uncertainty thing is just the point that you made, which is, I think, really profound, actually, which is that, you know, and we both, we're both kind of talking about this, the context is everything concept. I think because of that, it's so easy, and man, did I learn this as a consultant. You, you go into a, a project or you, you know, go work, start work with a client, and you think you can apply you know, the experience that you have to a problem. And a lot of it you can apply, but you're going to have some new things that you're going to find that you've never encountered before. <clears throat> and, and what's interesting is you know, every time, I think there's just this kind of like vibe out on social media and just with people in general, the internet has really brought this out in people and, it, and it's frustrating where you know, we all have our limiting beliefs, right? We all have things that we believe at our core and you know, everybody thinks of the big ones like religion and stuff like that, but even things as simple as, you know, is inheritance a good thing in certain situations? You know, or like, should we use Kanban? Like, like simple little things like that. Yeah. I, I think it, it's, it's hard often when every time we meet a new person or every time we get onto a new project, we're going to be challenged with some new information that it's great because it's going to cause us to grow. We're going to have to be confronted with something that we're not ready to deal with. And it's in all, and that what happens then though, is we have to sort of like let die the old knowledge, the old, like, you know, association with that truth that we thought we know, and we got to let that go away. And I think just, and it's not necessarily a, because there's anything wrong with anybody. I struggle with this too. I think just as people, it, it's hard to admit you're wrong or to even admit like, you know what, there's something I didn't consider. You're right. It's, and I, and I it's think- It's just we want to have rules. We do. And, and I mean, obviously- Rules make life easy. <laughs> and, and this is why, you know, another theme of this challenge, this channel is balance. Meaning like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have times you need to set a rule. You're going to have times yeah. you need to break a rule. You're going to have certain practices that work in 98% of cases, but there are 2% they just do not work in. Um, but I think the hard part is I think there's a lot of senior developers and architects and people that have been doing this for a while or, you know, they've worked at multiple companies and they get this but the they get put on projects and they're under so much pressure to deliver they don't really have the time to teach this knowledge to junior developers and help them yes. realize this and so you know sometimes you've got people i worked with this one guy you know he'd been at one fortune 50 for like 15 years and he was really really solid with a certain pro you know problem space and he was an architect out there and and i'm not knocking him at all you know fantastic guy but, you know, then... John, if you're listening. <laughs> I, I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, definitely not John. But um, if you pick the name that I thought it was, I'd be a little worried there. Like, oh, I can't get out of this one now. No, but, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, he's starting to, to offer some projects to small, you know, little boutique shops and, and, and putting in all this structure and all this, 
you know, abstraction and all these layers that, that really just aren't necessary. Yeah. And, and so I, th I think the thing that I'm really trying to help people with this channel with, and I, and is why I want guests like you on to help me too, is just to level up the expectations of developers that like, Hey, you know, like love your job, take pride yes. when you learn something, but dude, be careful. Because if you get to that point where you think you've got this shit and you really know something, you're going to get thrown into the fire back again and find out, oh my God, I don't know what's going on again. And so I think like the best developers are the ones who can really be a little bit more humble. And that's not something that, you know, who so wants hard. to be humble coming out of college, right? Your whole point is to prove yourself. But but there's Dude, I've been at this 20 years and I don't want to be humble. Oh, same here. But but I think uh, that's really what will sustain people's careers. I guess that's the message I'm trying to put out there because um, we're kind of getting towards the end is just if you want to have a long, sustainable career and you don't want to get burned out, I I'm just personally of the opinion that if you can keep that part of you that is ready to be shown i'm either wrong or maybe there's something i didn't consider and like learn to embrace that and be cool with that yeah. i mean i just just this interview like i'm going to go back and watch this and think on some of the stuff that you've said because sure. it's awesome it's going to you know it's going to broaden my understanding and i think um that's what's going to help people not burn out in five to seven years and just bail and become a manager is you know if you want to keep doing dev having that attitude but yeah, I'll let I'll, yeah. I'll switch it over to you. And you no, can kind and of... I think that's great. I'm just going to follow up on that to, yeah, yeah. to sort of wrap up. And I think one of the reasons that you know you and me and and there are other people like us who are getting into this space, um, specifically of of you know, uh, and obviously like some of us have day jobs where you know we we exercise this kind of stuff, and others have moved more purely into like mentorship kind of roles and stuff. Right. But. Um, you know, if if developers, I'll say younger developers, but I, I mean younger in their in their careers, right? Um, look for people who are going to challenge you, um, and and I don't mean people on Stack Overflow. You know, I, I mean <laughs> right. people like you know, right? Uh, people like like me, like Jamie. Our Twitter handles, like they're, yep. they're right. Like if you set your concept for a thing, I will very nicely rip it to shreds. Um, right. And it, it's, you need to, on the one hand, and, and speaking to your thing of balance, on the one hand, you need to hold the requirement of being able to get the job done in order to make money to put food on the table. Right. And on the other hand, you need to hold the mystery and the beauty and the art and the magic of what it is that we do, which is, you know, whispering to machines in a way yep. that nobody else can do. Yep. Um, and when you balance those two things... Um, you'll just you'll get better and better. But Absolutely. a huge part of that is is challenging yourself and finding people who are actually going to challenge you. Absolutely. And man, I love it. Love it what you said. Um, I think one of the challenges that that I'm trying to get good at, and I think this channel is is bringing out the need for me to do this, is to take the skills I learned in consulting to be able to talk with VPs and directors that sometimes they're, they got a lot of power. They're not used to being challenged and take those same skills and use those to help developers. Yeah. And because, you know, I think earlier in my career, you know, when I first became an architect, I would help teach things to people, but I was an ass about it. You know, I, yes. I like you said, ripping them to shreds. I think, you know, I know what you mean. Yeah. There's an attitude, though. You can rip that's someone they, that's, to... That's your soundbite for Reddit. Yeah, right. I mean, you can rip their ideas to shreds, uh, though, in a way that, like, look, I'm going to change your world, but I'm helping exactly. you by doing this, versus, like, yeah. I'm going to change your world because you're an idiot. And I know you're not right. like that. Um, and I'm not either, but I think there's so many... Uh, more experienced developers, just like the two of us out there that I think are, you know, they're struggling away at their day job. They're not getting enough recognition. They're under a lot of pressure and they have yeah. so much to offer to younger developers. Yeah. You know, if I can help them, you know, through talking to you and everybody else and everybody else can help each other so that they can set better boundaries for themselves, you know, 
help their companies understand, look, we need to level up, not just me, we need to level up our whole engineering organization. You know, that would be something that would really make me feel like, uh, this was an extremely valuable exercise doing this channel mm -hmm. um, is yeah. if I can start to help people feel like they're, you know, able to, to make a difference at their companies. Cause I mean, that, that's the thing that frustrated me in consulting in the last 10 years is, you know, as making great money, really amazing opportunities, uh, continually growing, but you can only do so much when you're working with one company, you know, and I yeah. think you know, the development community is it's continuing to explode, right? It, there's just more people pouring into it all the time. And, you know, I, I just, I guess I got to a point where I'm like, just like you were talking about, I still got to put food on my table, but I, I I'm kind of sick of, I, I wrote blog posts for a real long time and they kind of know went mm -hmm. nowhere. And I kind of thought, you know what, I got to just start putting videos out there and kind of looking like an idiot and trying to figure this out, you know? And, and I mean, this yeah. is an ongoing process. Like I, you saw probably my decorporatization video or maybe you didn't yet. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. I'm trying to let go of like Mr. Consultant, you know, because right. I've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, but man, well, and, and, go and ahead. that's, yeah. um, well, well, and that, that's another thing is, you know, I, I think that, it's really, you know, you were talking about humility and, and it's really hard, especially as a junior developer, you're faced with, you have a lot of knowledge. Yeah. Um, you know, you just learned, I mean, especially if you're, let's say you're three or four, like you feel like you have leveled up to a level that is really insane. You know? It is. And yeah. you're like, you're like, wow, like I know so much more than 85% of the population. I understand how the iPhone works. I understand how Netflix does its stuff. Yep. I know what a chaos monkey is. Yeah. It is mind blowing the godly right. power that is flowing, you know, uh, between my hands. Um, and then, you know, you start to talk about like elliptic curve cryptography and like what's the difference between a 2048 bit key and a 5096 oh, bit yeah. key and like what are redundancy bits and Going how do you the thread schedule? And you start to go, oh shit. And I'll tell you, the best compliment I ever had in my entire career, and, you know, please fill up my DMs if, like, you can give me a better compliment. But, um, you know, I was working, and the, uh, the head of, the VP of engineering of a very large um, company that I won't name um, to protect the innocent um, flew out to, to where I was working, and he spent a day with us reviewing our software to integrate it with his and this is a guy with like a phd and you know had written books and stuff and like the guy was a big deal um and uh at the lunch break he looked at me and very quietly he said you know what you guys have built here it's pretty cool and i was like wow you know i was just floored and so as a junior dev like and this is why i say find people to challenge you because the, you have to go and, 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 and look at that VP and explain to them what they don't know and what they don't understand. But you also have to go and find that senior developer who is, you know, as, as you're saying, who's sort of calcified in their chair there on the, on the 18th floor, you know, coding away, at, you know, as the like mastermind of the company. And right. you have to pull them out of there and you have to say, dude, teach me. I am your fucking Padawan. Like, yes. You know, lead me to greatness. Like, pull, go and reach into their head and pull out what they have, um, because you will also give them life back. Absolutely. And you'll breathe life back into their day job, uh, and it's it's huge. If we can we can wrap up uh, in just a minute here. I I I just wanted to throw out there because I thought you made me think of something, and 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 man, that is so I think important to junior developers out there. Uh, for you to hear this if you are a junior developer or you just have more senior uh, folks that you have available to you. When I first came out of college and I was at my first programming gig and I was an intern and I was literally writing unit tests kind of in VB or something. I mean, it was like I didn't know what the heck I was doing. About, a, <laughs> about six months after being there, there was this gentleman they hired. Actually, I think he already worked for like a different location he transferred in. And he was super grizzled. I mean, he was pissed all the time. He, he was just really, really angry and bitter, and his marriage was going through a lot of stuff. And I don't know what it was about him, but I liked him. Like, I liked, uh, 
I knew he was experienced, and he, he wasn't experienced like he was a guru. It's just I knew he was older, and he'd been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And I was so new, and I was working with a lot of other guys that were my age or maybe 10 years older. But th this gentleman, I want to say he was in his early 60s, and I was like 20 or 21, right? So I just remember, though, after like a few weeks, I just kind of like, because I was a few we were on these, we didn't have cues. We were kind of on these long tables where everybody was next right. to each other. I kind of wheeled over to him and I would just asked him some innocent, stupid question just to kind of, I was kind of like, how's this guy going to respond? You know, yeah. like I didn't have a relationship with him yet. And yeah. he was, you know, kind of barked at me or whatever. And, you know, and then I just kind of did it again the next day. And pretty soon he got, he got the signal and, and he's like, Oh, this dude wants to learn from me. And, and yeah. after that, I mean, his attitude was different. He was like happy to come into work and I started learning so much stuff. So, <clears throat> you know, if, if there's one thing I just a uh, little tidbit to leave, uh, for me, it's just that even the most fr seemingly frustrated senior guys or gals at your company that seem like they don't have enough time and they're frustrated and they wish everybody else would do a better job coding. If you approach them that you want to learn, it, I mean, be prepared. They may be like, I don't have time and you might have to try a little bit, but, but like yeah. you can really bring a lot of positivity to that person. If you show them that you want to learn and you will, you know, I, I have a cousin that, that, uh, is also in the industry and we've gotten to work together. And I mean, I've seen him, he went in like four years, he learned what took me like 15, just because his attitude was so amazing yeah. about like just being really respectful to people and really being willing to just like soak in experience that people had. Well, and and, yeah. and part of the reason that these people are, are so bitter is that they feel like they're not knowledge is not respected and that what they know is not useful um, and that nobody really cares about what they think. Um, yeah. I, I really, I, I don't think there's a better point, you know, for us to sort of settle on as like the outcome of the whole thing um, than, than to say, you know, to be a sponge um, and, and yeah, to work past that sort of spiny barrier because inside in the middle is a, squ a squishy little you know, dev that they, that they were when they yep. started off full of, you know, dreams and aspirations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I guarantee you they would all, every single one of them would love, love to share that with somebody who was genuinely interested, who was yep. genuinely going to listen, um, and, and genuinely try their best to apply, you know, the, the lessons that they have to pass on. Absolutely. This was awesome, man. I'm so yeah, glad cool. we did this. Super glad we did this. I, I had yeah. no idea what to expect, but I didn't with Scott either, even though he's been commenting on my channel for like a year. Yeah. Uh, That's because we don't have videos that, you know, we can't watch, you can't watch <laughs> us, but we, we get to come in here knowing like more or less what you're about. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that, that, the thing that helps me with though, and it's encouraging to me is that I'm starting to put enough of my ideas out there that the people who are approaching me they feel comfortable enough. Hey, I've got some value I can yeah. add. So that's good that, you know, that this is happening now. I'm, I'm really but, encouraged. But by just that. so we're clear, like I, you know, when I wrote to you and, and again, this is like junior devs, like you have to understand this, like me and Jamie have been doing this 20 years. And still, right. when I wrote to him, I'm like, shit, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, there's no possible way, like the stuff I could have to say would be interesting to this dude. Like, you know, dude's got a YouTube channel. He gets like hundreds of views on his videos, you know, like, which Meanwhile, is like nothing on YouTube, but for developers, it's something. Yeah. Listen, man, like yeah. I, so, and, and I, you know, just recently I've started to put myself out there on Twitter. I've been, I've been sort of under that corporate umbrella for so long. Um, I've had a Twitter account for ages, but I, I just started and I, I'm starting to get some people who are sort of interested and have some conversations and stuff. And I was saying to my wife the other day, like, I get it. Now the guys on YouTube that hit a thousand subscribers and they're genuinely jumping up and down because it is amazing when you guys reach out it is amazing when people reach out and say what you know is valuable and yes. i want it for myself so yeah uh, so i'm super glad that that you know that we were able to to do this and i oh, totally and I, I fully hope we'll do it again <laughs> definitely i i mean i'm gonna rotate through 
there's a few people that like over the last year kind of came upon me wanted to do this and i just didn't have my stuff together enough to do it right. yet and now that i do i kind of want to have them on but like yeah. you scott you know potentially some of the other people i'm going to interview you know i i definitely want to get into a rhythm that w at least once a week you know and 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 that's the thing we'll see where this goes you know this could lead more into a podcast format this could sure. go into a more interactive type thing we'll we're going to have to figure it out together vote, yeah. vote below if you want it to be a podcast <laughs> Well, I mean, and it, it, the, and my, my, I have an older son who corrected me on this, but, uh, uh, you know, I do, I do make all of these available on most of the podcast platforms for people to listen to. He was like, well, dad, that's not the same as a podcast. A podcast is an hour and it's a certain format. And I was like, yeah. I, you got me, man. You know, and I you got have you. good music and good audio. Yeah, exactly. Man. Right. This is just kind <laughs> of like, you know, me blabbering, but, uh. For sure. Yeah. Any feedback in the comments on Ian, me, where you want this to go, things you think we thought were really cool, things where you thought we were idiots, throw them down there. Absolutely. Well, great, man. Thanks so much for being on. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me.